again for taking your time and coming on with us. Uh, you've been around the block yeah. once or twice, and you probably have some incredible stories for us. I got some good ones, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's hear them. How did you start out in this whole music thing? Well, it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> it was an accident. I, I always loved music. Growing up, <clears throat> I used to listen to the radio all the time. You know, back in the, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, there was some great stuff on the radio. One of my first records that I ever bought was uh, The Book of Love by the Monotones. And I used to love uh, Dion and the Belmonts. I used to love that stuff. I just, I used to ride my bicycle down the street and sing the songs at the top of my lungs, all that kind of stuff. Not interested in just drums, but music in general, right? All, all, all the music that was going on. When it, later on in my career, when I asked my dad, why did you buy me drums? He said, because they didn't make Prozac when you were a kid. <laughs> so I, I guess I guess I was pretty crazy. <laughs> but um, uh, the great part about it was, I realize now, is that I was learning music before I learned drums. You know, learning how, how of the formula of music. You know, there, there's usually the intro, then there's the verse, then there's the chorus, then there's another verse, and another chorus, then there's a bridge, you know. The, the 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 way it's formed so i'm pretty lucky that that i got it that way liberty do you play any other instruments i play a little bit of guitar enough to write songs or look at uh, the internet and find out how to play blackbird and uh, how to play i'm so tired it's both beatles songs you know but I'll, I'll hit a chord every now and then and i was like what the heck is this chord you know you got a good ear. You, you can pick that stuff up and, and, and notice it right away that you're hearing something different that you haven't done yourself. Yes, I think I do have a good ear. Um, my dream was to play piano, but when you play with somebody as great as Billy Joel, you you know don't even want to attempt it. <laughs> and he you is know. great. So what's interesting, you met Billy Joel when you were a kid. Yeah, 17. He was, he, I think he just turned 18. I was 17. We played in the same club called the My House in Plainview, New York. And uh, he was in a band called The Hassles. I was in the New Rock Workshop. And we were both the house bands at this, this club. It was an underage club. Uh, only soda was sold. And once in a while, we'd play together. And I would pass him in the dark just to say hello. You know, so when um, I got the call, uh, when Billy asked for a New York-style drummer, he was moving back to New York after making two albums with studio musicians. I think Ron Tut played on Piano Man and and uh, Street Life Serenata. He wanted to move back to New York. He wanted to use the same guys to record his records and go on the road. And uh, he said he wanted a New York-style drummer. And Doug Stegmeyer was already in the band, and I had played in a band with Doug called Topper. And Doug said, well, you already know the guy. And he mentioned my name. And so, and the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> All right. Liberty, I got to ask you, you mentioned something, a New York style drummer. What is a New York style drummer as compared to a LA or a Boston based drummer? Okay. Uh, New York style drummer is uh, very aggressive, where a, an LA drummer would be very laid back. Uh, compare the New York Dolls to the Eagles or something like that, you know, uh, the Ramones come out of New York, you know, things like that. The Eagles come out of L.A. It's, uh, Fleetwood Mac comes out of L.A. It's a different kind of playing. And I found that out, really. I, I did six months with Stevie Nicks on the road. And, man, that was tough because it, on the East Coast, and I'm going to include Boston in that, too, on the East Coast, uh, we have a camaraderie when when you have a group like a band. There's there's a you, you are attached at the hip. It's almost like a marriage. And if one guy is is failing because he has a hangover or whatever, when you're playing that night, the other guys will pick up for you. In California, that didn't happen. If like you couldn't pr uh, produce, you were in trouble. You know. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was just a weird thing for me because I always thought, you know, one guy depends on the other. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, if he's sick, you're going to step in and, and do a little bit more to help him, you know, along. But he, and nobody will know that he's really sick. He just, 
you're taking over a little bit more. It's kind of like that. When Billy was sick, I would play harder just so people would focus now more on me and not watch Billy as much. Mm-hmm. You know, it was that kind of thing. But with Stevie and, uh, and that band, Waddy Wattel was in that band. And they're just these California kind of players. Okay. So you, you mentioned Stevie Nicks. You also played with a lot of other big names. Yes. Harley, yes. Harley Simon. Paul McCartney was a trip, man. It was a trip because I didn't know who it was going to be when I got the phone call. I said, uh, Phil Ramone, he was producing this session. And he said, uh, uh, Phil wants you in the studio on this date, blah, blah, blah. And I had to go to um, a, a, a bridal party dinner because I was uh, one of the best men in uh, Brian Ruggles, who was our uh, sound man, his, his wedding. He said, oh, I can't make it that day. I got to do Brian's bridal party dinner. And, and the other side of the phone said, cancel it. I said, I can't. It's Brian's thing. I can't cancel it. Who's it with? Who's this session with? He said, well, I can't tell you. Well, I, I, I can't do it unless you tell me. Well, who, who, who is it? So after about 15 minutes, he finally goes, Paul McCartney. So I said, I'll call you right back. And I called up. I, I asked my mother. I said, Mom, uh, I got this little predicament. I said, I got my friend's bridal party dinner. And um, they want me in for a session. And uh, she said, oh, Lib, you, you got to go to your friend's dinner. You have to do that. You know, you're committed to it. you got to do it. She said, who's, who's the artist you want, they want you to play with? I said, Paul McCartney. She said, Frank Brian Ruggles, go to the session. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you're a very well-established musician, and people look up to you. Have you ever come yes. across a musician like Paul McCartney that you were a little bit taken back that, you know, I don't want to say starstruck, but a little bit overwhelmed? starstruck is an understatement we i went there early to the session right because uh phil ramon wanted me to set the drums up and we wanted to have the sound and everything so when he walked in so i'm standing there we're listening to these tapes that phil's playing and the first one to come in is linda you know his wife at the time linda and she like all the way there i'm thinking to myself what does he want with me he doesn't know who i am he doesn't care you know so Linda walks in and the first thing she does is points at me and goes, I know who you are. We've been watching your videos. It's like, are you kidding me? Wow. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, so then he walks in and it's like the C parts, you know, it's like God just walked in the room. Right. Here he is. This is him in the flesh. So he's, he's saying hi to everybody. He walks up to me and he shakes my hand. He goes, hi. Um, you know, I'm Paul, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah, like he <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> himself. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad you introduced yourself because I was a little confused for a minute. <laughs> you know? And then I, I had to back out of the control room just to control, you know, just to get my composure back. And it was like the angel and the devil on each shoulder. One, one was saying that, you know, he's just another musician, just like you are. The other one's going, Oh, yeah, right. That's Paul McCartney. He's a Beatle. He's the Beatle. You know, it's like, so I had to really like settle down and tell myself, settle down and just go in and be yourself. Yeah. And, and that's what I did. And we had a great time. Here's, here's a funny thing I got to ask you. When, when someone like that's coming into the studio, as you say, they weren't supposed to tell you who was who you were playing with that time. But does the studio like say, okay, those 19 people that are usually in here take tomorrow off. We just need this essential people so that when he walks in, he's not inundated with people who have just been hanging around to just watch him walk in. Yeah. Uh, well, I think um, th- they kind of pick a day when there's not a lot of people there. Just so when he walks in, it's not, they're not all over him and the session isn't delayed and people aren't walking in to see what's going on. Cause I don't remember a whole lot of people being in the studio that day. Interesting. Interesting. Let's get to Billy Joel. So that was why, (laughs) why (laughs) Billy who? (laughs) So that was, um, you knew we were going to get to it. Um, that was the biggest part of your career. You were with him for 30 years, 30 years. I still haven't had a match out of three marriages. None of them have lasted that long so far. 
this this one's going for twenty one years right now. We'll okay, see. You're almost there. Another another nine years. You. Yeah. <laughs> so it is kind of like a marriage being in a band. It's definitely a marriage. You know, there's a saying: it's really easy to put a band together, but it's almost impossible to keep them together. You know, um, yeah, but it's like a marriage. Everybody has an opinion, and everybody, you know, it gets to a point where they want to do it their way. Liberty, it's you like know, a, a co-host on a podcast. Trust me, just like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's like a marriage, and you guys had your ups and downs. And yes, you were his right hand man for years, according to what I read. Yeah. Yes, I was. Uh, so when it ended, people were surprised because I remember my uh, lawyer calling me and, and saying, I can't believe he let you go because you know where the bodies are buried. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, we we did a lot together. I mean, he would call me in the middle of the night and, and uh, say, hey, I got this song and he'd be singing the song to me and stuff. And this one song was, was, uh, it was called That Ain't You Man, you know, and, and it was him standing in the balcony of, of a church and watching his own funeral and what people are saying about him and everything like that. And he's like, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. I didn't, you know, it was like that kind of thing. I said, Billy, nice, but sucks. It just, you know, that thing about a funeral, I don't think it's a good good idea. He goes, I knew you were going to say that. He goes, it's back to the drawing board. And he, and he changed it. And it's uh, getting closer on the Bridge album now. Okay. You know, that Stormfront uh, was another one where he's talking about uh, his his boat, you know, um, and uh, about getting ready to set sail, but there's a Stormfront coming. and And I said, you know, the next verse... Why didn't it be like you're talking about a woman? So actually your boat becomes a woman, just as symbolizes a woman. And the storm that's coming is, is in your relationship. Next verse started, I got a woman. My life should be easy. You know, so yeah, I threw ideas to him and, and you know, it, it, we had a great relationship. Let's put it that way. Great relationship. So he was the main writer on a lot of the songs, but you also he, elaborated with him in... Uh, oh, he was the writer. He was the he, writer. he wrote the songs. Yes, we just threw in things. Yeah, and I understand that was that part of the problem between what happened with you and Billy was you didn't get the credit that you deserved. No, uh, that that's what happened after uh, we ended. Uh, a lawyer looked at at uh, things that I wasn't paid for, and you know, this little. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Intellectual properties and stuff like that. I wasn't getting and stuff like that. But no, the, the separation wasn't because of that. It was because somebody said something to him that I did something, but he never confronted me about it. And when when the the, the cutoff came, I never went to him. We were both like, you know, hey, fuck him. You know, <laughs> it's like that kind of thing. You know, I don't care anymore. You know, I don't care anymore either you know 30 years after. and you didn't find out in a in a cool way you found out was it a uh award ceremony that was going on no 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 um i found out i heard on the radio that he was that he was playing at madison square garden or something like that oh god and he oh was... no you know what happened this is what happened he was getting married to his third wife i think or something like that maybe fourth I don't know which one, but, <laughs> but um, I talked to the keyboard player, Dave Rosenthal, and I said, well, I guess we're not going to the wedding. Uh, we never got a, a wedding invitation. And Dave said, I got mine. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> oh, oh, that that's, that's nice. Thanks pal. <laughs> yeah. So I called people and Everyone had the same answer. Like, I don't know. I don't know anything. I know nothing. All right. Wow. You know, that's a fine so, to do for someone that, you know, backed right. him up all those years and, you know, was part of his family. Yeah. Well, when I wrote my book, I, um, I started, I, you know, do you know my book? Do you guys? Absolutely. You read it? 
Okay. So uh, when I started to write that book, I was writing uh, uh, family history for my kids. That's what I was writing. I have four daughters, and I wanted them to know where their grandpa my grandparents came from, what my dad did in World War II, and his brothers, and all that kind of stuff. So when I parted ways with Billy, I said, okay, now I can include Billy in there. And I started to write about a lot of the junk, the junk stuff. And I thought, I can't do this. This is not me. You know, it's not me. So what I did was I put my feet in Billy's shoes and I wanted to look at why he did what he did to people. You know, um, the man had a career, has a career of 50 years of being on the top. I mean, everybody knows who he is. He's still selling out Madison Square Garden. You know, he's, I just found out, I just, I just read on the internet that he's playing New Year's Eve at this place here in uh, Brooklyn. And um, so I know that with each, each album, he would change kind of styles, you know, turnstiles, he tried to produce himself. The Stranger, he got Phil Ramone. And, and it took on a certain sound. With now, now the band is playing with him. 52nd Street was leaning more towards a, a jazzy kind of edge. Then came Glass Houses, which is just total rock band, just the band played. You know, so he kept changing. He did that with personnel too, to stay fresh. And it it's sad. You don't mean to hurt somebody, but you have to do it to stay alive. Yeah. You, know, you know what I mean? Like somebody doesn't change their style. You keep going to the same hamburger stand and it's the same thing over and over again. You're like, I'm going to look for another one, you know, just to shake it up a bit. Right. You know, so that that's the way Billy is. Yeah, I guess there's a method to that madness. And, and it does, might not make sense to everybody because look at some of the bands, Aerosmith, uh, Rolling Stones, that they've stayed on top of their game and not a lot has changed in, in their bands, but everyone's different. Yeah, I mean, you know, Bill Wyman left, had it, you know, that's it, I'm done. And if you read Keith's book, you saw that him and Mick have had it out many times. Yep. Yep. But yeah, they, they knew the music was was more important than, uh, you know, letting people go. And they, you, you just alluded to, and if Billy wants to come on sometime and talk to us on the podcast about things, you know, uh, you alluded to, you know, he was on his third marriage then. Obviously, he's not great with relationships. No, true, <laughs> true, true. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I have the band the Lords of Fifty Second Street. Okay, you know, uh, it's myself, Russell Javers from the Billy Band, and Richie Canada who played the sax on all those classic Billy songs. Only to get that young, she's um, in front of an Italian restaurant, still rock and roll to me. And we got a band together. We got a guy sitting in the Billy seat, plays piano and sings. And we're going to be up by Boston, somewhere in New Hampshire. New Hampshire's close, right? I can't yeah. make you go away, right? Right, right so, around. Uh, no, nah, it's right around the corner, New Hampshire. Yeah. We will be there. I am definitely will like to come up and meet you in person. Yeah, absolutely. So and uh, on that note, meeting you and, and finding out more about you, Liberty, where'd the name come from? My real name is Libertori. L-I-B-E-R-A-T-O-R-I. -E it should be an E, but I don't know why it's an I. Because in Italian, I is is multiple, you know. Yes. Yeah, um, yes. So um it was my uh uncle's name. When my my when World War II broke out, five brothers went in and only four came home. One was killed in France, and his name was Liberty, uh, Libertori. So my dad named me after him. That's awesome. And uh it, it they thought he was crazy for naming me that because my uncle would get in fights all the time when he was a kid because the Statue in Harbor is a girl, the Statue of Liberty, you know, so he had a fight. But when the 60s came around, I was in like that. The, the song from the Strange Realm, Only the Good Die Young. Uh, Billy wrote it as a reggae tune in the beginning. And, uh, you know, it just sounded, come up, Virginia, don't check that. He wrote it on guitar, so it, he was writing it as a reggae tune. When we got in the studio, I told him that, that was terrible. <laughs> it, it, really, it really stinks. Uh, I told him that the closest he's ever been to Jamaica was the Jamaica train station in Queens, you know, where they, you switch change to go out to Long Island. He said, terrible, terrible. So uh, in, in the words of Paul Simon, 
he says, if you make a song lighthearted, the lyrics will fly right over everybody's head. I mean, the song is about uh, a girl giving herself up for the first time. And, and Billy it wants to be that guy that does it, you know. <laughs> so it's like... Didn't we all? <laughs> yes, yes, we all did. And uh, so now it's being recorded, but it's got such a lighthearted feel that n nobody really knows. They just, uh, you know, only the good die young. Da -da 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 -da. They don't realize that. <laughs> you know, your mother never prays for me. You know, I want to laugh with the sinners and cry with the saints. You know, call me when it's time. You know, that, that kind of stuff. So it's, so it's, pr it's pretty crazy. But yeah, I, I threw sticks at them to get that, that, that feel. And the feel, I actually stole it. I stole a feel from... Uh, <laughs> You know, great drummers borrow, but I mean, good drummers borrow, but great drummers steal. I love yeah. it. So I remember uh, a song on the Jimi Hendrix album, Axis Bold is Love, uh, Up From the Skies. It comes in right after that whole thing where he's talking and he's talking to a spaceman and all that kind of stuff. And you hear his guitar fly away. And then you hear Mitch Mitchell do that same fill that I do. And it goes, I just want to talk to you. Da, da. So the same thing. Come out, Virginia. Don't let me. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, it sounds good in it. Now, if I can give you a little idea, right? I Maybe you should go back, take that, do it as a reggae cover, and see if it takes off. And if it does, he'll be sitting at home going, that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So uh, is, is there any way that you think that you'll play with Billy again, or is it is it divorce final? Well, the question that I would have is, what's in it for me? <laughs> I mean, you know, going to the garden, these people are going to the garden. He had Kevin Bacon there, and uh, he's got all these other people playing one song with him. And everybody's like, yay, that's for the night. And then it's done. It's over. It's like, okay, what 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 do I get out of this now? Right. You know, right. did Kevin Bacon get more famous because he played with Billy Joel? No, I don't think so. You know, the crowd would love it. They would think it's great. I, I would think that the whole band should go back, me, Russell, and Richie, you know, uh go back and play together with him. But you know what? There's there's too many people behind the Billy Joel machine that I just don't want to have a don't, don't want to go back and see. Yeah. Um, no. How many iterations of the band since you guys have left, how many other people have come and gone in, in, as he's evolved? Um, I think he's pretty much stuck with the same band. They're the band that did the uh, Broadway play moving out, you know, <laughs> Broadway play. <laughs> It's funny because you're such a rock and roller. Pounding on the piano, flips off the piano. And we were, when we used to play together, we throw sticks at each other, doing that kind of stuff. You know, I knocked him off a chair once. We were at a restaurant. I knocked him off the chair. He couldn't lift his arm up. He had a hard time playing the piano that night. You know, all that kind of stuff. And now he's got the Broadway band playing this. That's a big thing. The music. Yeah. You know, people say he's got the greatest wedding band in the world. <laughs> <laughs> So you talk about the backstage shenanigans that went on. There must have been some stories and some fan stories that, you know, really stick out in your mind. What's the craziest fan story that, you know, you remember? Craziest fan story ever is. Uh, in the book, I write about groupies because you have to write about groupies, right? Groupies aren't always girls. They're guys, too, that, that become obsessed with the band. I had one guy at one point that that actually was starting to put on my skin to get to Billy. And because we were playing with Elton at the same time to get to Elton too. So like I, I was seeing this happen, like he was starting to represent me <laughs> when he'd go meet Billy. And I, I so I, I immediately cut the friendship off. That wasn't the weirdest one. The weirdest one was this one guy we were going to play in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. 
So this one guy finds out and we're coming to town and he's like, this is going to be so great. You guys are coming to town. It's going to be wonderful. You know, I'll get some backstage passes. You give me backstage passes. I'll, you know, I'll come backstage. It's going to be great. I write him back in the email. Hey, look, Elton's on the tour with us. There's no backstage. I don't know who the guy is, right? There's no backstage. Oh, Lib, come on. It's going to be great. I'm going to send you guys food. You go. And then now he starts to send me these uh, uh, bottles of booze, you know, whiskey. I don't know why he's sending me whiskey, but he's sending me whiskey. And I'm, I'm writing him back. Thank you for the whiskey. But there's no backstage. There's nothing. We leave after the show. You know, he sends on the day of the show, he sends a full spread of bagel and locks and all kinds of things. Gigantic table full of it. I still don't know who the guy is. I'm not leaving him backstage passes. I don't care how much Woody sends, right? I don't want to get screwed. Okay. Next day I get up. I look at my emails. Dear Lib, you motherfucker. <laughs> you can suck Satan's dick. All it, all, it's shit like that. I mean, like, like, wow. like, I can't believe I was standing in my line with my dick in my hands and all these people with their with, with these girls on their arms going backstage and I'm just standing there. I'm not even on a list. I'm so embarrassed. You know, you could suck Satan's dick. It was like, like you know, I hope I, I'll see you in hell. You better look over your shoulder all the time. It was so bad. Holy shit. It was so bad that they rushed me out of the hotel to the airport to leave. And the police went to his place of work. Oh my. Because this was like a threatening note. Wow. That's scary. Look over your shoulder. Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd have to uh, say I, I would have wanted protection at that point. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm you glad you didn't get him backstage. <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. You know, that was frightening. I, I would imagine. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. how everyone does want to get backstage. It's like the, the rite of passage. I mean, yeah. Being on the road, all, all sorts of things happen on tour when you have people like Elton come along. What was the biggest change or who did you perform with that had the biggest change or the biggest rider that says, okay, this can't happen or that can't happen? Any Anything along that line that stands out? Oh, Elton's. Of course, Elton's. You know, um, he had these two guys dressed as Romans in their, their white you know, little, little skirts and out in front of his kind of makeshift tent dressing room, you know, standing guard. <laughs> Centurions from the Roman era. Yes. Ogres. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, I actually got to go in, me and my wife went into his dressing room once, his, his um, his wardrobe guy got us into his dressing room and to see it was amazing because all his suits were set up in, in color order. You know, his glasses, all his glasses were opened on a table just so he could pick whatever pair he wants to wear that night. Oh my goodness. Then at the, then at the time he was into bobbleheads and he had a, a coffee table filled with bobbleheads and this night he for some reason he wanted the bobbleheads to watch tv with him <laughs> so he turned the bobbleheads they were all turned towards the tv and the funny thing is, is that billy and elton bobbleheads were in the front yeah <laughs> sounds like a michael jackson episode <laughs> uh, yeah i mean you, you know you have to do whatever makes you feel like you're home for a minute you know in your little room you have to have certain things it you really, know like it some guys burn it, it really makes you uh, want his room at home was like then right i mean <laughs> yeah right you know some people burn candles in their dressing room whatever. incense and, you know there's certain kind of food that you want and stuff like that but yeah that was that was uh pretty unique pretty yeah, unique. sounds like a pretty eccentric guy yeah yeah, I don't think I ever went in Stevie Nicks' dressing room. I, I don't think I went in her dressing room. Your wife wouldn't have allowed yeah. uh, No, it wasn't that. I don't think um, 
I don't think I ever had the desire to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Stevie, Stevie, I have to say, Stevie, um, I, my second wife, Stevie Nix's first, uh, was her roommate. Oh, no. They were roommates. Yeah. And um, that's how I, I met her. She was on the road. She would, did the merch. And um, Stevie, uh, over the years, even when me and my second wife divorced, was very good to my children. You know, um, my daughter, who's an actress, she went out to California and um, Stevie let her stay at her house for like a year just to get her career started. Wow. My other daughter drove out to California. She was going to go live out there and a car broke down in Arizona. Stevie got her a new car, you know, like really kind like that, you know? Beautiful. Yeah. Of all the people you toured, who did you have the most fun on the road with? Oh, Billy, of course. Yeah. Billy was always fun. You know, I mean, it got serious later on. Right. In the beginning, it was fun. I mean, we lit fireworks in a hotel once. We we stopped by this place. We got these fireworks. I mean, it, it was down south, so you can get any kind of fireworks. And we decided we're going to shoot them off in the hotel. The next morning, <laughs> the maids walk in and they scream because you can't see down the hall. There's smoke all over the place. They think the place is on fire. Yeah. So yeah, there's that. And, uh, I, I, we used to go out, and you know, after after you do a show, you want to stop somewhere, have a drink, settle down. And we're, we're driving home from a place in Ohio, a, a gig we did, and there's a bar we go by, and I'm with uh, uh, Richie Kanata and and um, I think Russell was with us and Doug Stegmaier, and they and they say, hey, there's a bar over there, let's stop. And I said to myself. Uh, only one drink. That's it. Only one drink. One drink turns into, you know, <laughs> and I ended up driving a, a car into a hotel, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and got arrested that night. And the cops took me away. But the funny thing is, is the next morning, now we used to do this thing where you would drive a car forward, you know, go about 40, 50 miles an hour, slam on the brakes and then throw it in reverse and then step on the gas again. So the car is still going forward, but the wheels are going backwards, you know, and it would leave marks in the, in the, in the uh, uh, parking lots and stuff like that. So anyway, the next day, of course, the hotel calls the police. The next day, the police come and I hear them knocking on a door down the hall and it, it's Billy's door they're knocking on, right? And I hear the voice go, what? <laughs> Athens Police Department. You want room seven? <laughs> oh, <my room. laughs> he threw you into the bus. Rattled me out immediately. <laughs> and they took me away. They took me. Our tour manager at the time, he, he um, convinced them that we had a gig. And they said, uh, well, the judge is gone for the weekend. He's out fishing. You know that line, uh, so you have to wait till Monday to, you know, stand trial or be arraigned or whatever they call it. And um, so my my tour manager said, "What can we do? He's playing. They're playing tonight. You know, another gig." He said, "Well, he can get bailed out, and you can jump bail, but don't get stopped in Ohio for seven years." That's when we changed our names, our tour names. So right. every time we we went into a Another city, we, uh, with somebody else. So it wasn't listed as Liberty to be done. <laughs> There's a way around everything. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's get back to the band you're currently playing in and give them a shout out and uh, promote them a little bit. Who is in that band? The Lords of 52nd Street. Um, we, let me see if I can find, if I can find that uh, freaking email where oh, I can't find it. Anyway. Lords of 52nd Street, it's myself, Russell Jabbers, plays guitar and sings, uh, and Richie Kanata, who played on all those uh, Billy Joel classics, Only Good Die Young, uh, uh, Still Rock and Roll of Me, Seeds from an Italian Restaurant, all that saxophone you hear, Stiletto, The Strange, all, everything. And he also played keyboards, uh, organ, flute, she's always a woman, all that kind of stuff. We have a band called the Lords of 52nd Street. The name was given to us on the 
sleeve of the 52nd Street album when Phil Ramone listed who played on the record. He called us the Lords of 52nd Street. Um, we have a guy, Dan Orlando, who, who does the Billy Seat. Uh, and we have a bass player, Malcolm Gold, and uh, uh, Anthony plays guitar, and, and Doug Kishner plays keyboards. And um, so it's all filled. I mean, you get the full band thing. Now, the thing that's great about it is Billy has dropped the keys to the songs since he's gotten older and can't hit the notes anymore. Where Dan is a young guy. He wasn't even born when we made the albums. So Dan can hit all the notes and sings the songs in the same key of the record. So we sound more like Billy's records than Billy does. Oh. So we do a lot of the, the earlier stuff, like stuff from Turnstile, Stranger, 52nd Street, Glass Houses, you know, uh, the, that, that kind of stuff. The, the how 70s. Long, how long has this band been together? Oh, we've been together for about, uh, I don't know, 10 years now, maybe. And you're, you're doing a regular tour all across the U.S.? <clears throat> Pretty much, yeah. We do spots. It's not like not like the old days, you know, we're at the age where I want to go home for, to rest a little bit, you know. So, uh, yeah, we go uh, all different places. We've been to California, Florida. All that. Sounds like a great show. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We play theaters, you know, uh, 1,000, 1,500. The audience can find out more at www.lordsof52ndstreet.com. Lordsof52ndstreet.com. And they're playing the Concord, New Hampshire Chubb Theater at CCA on September 15th. It's amazing that you know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> the power of Google. <laughs> Mark, I happen to be available September 15th. I, I, I think I am as well. And, and I'm looking. So we're going to have to get some tickets and go up and check out Liberty. Well, I'll put you on a list, man. Let me know. Yo, can we get backstage? <laughs> <laughs> you son of a. <laughs> I also have another band. I have another band called the Slim Kings. Now you can Google them okay. and you can. Um, I'm the uh, old school guy in the band and the other guys are like in their 30s. And we write our, all our own songs. And we, we've had placements on commercials and TVs and, and stuff like that. And uh, we just got a record deal in Canada. <laughs> so wow. uh, we're doing that now. We're, we're writing the songs, you know. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're, so still, you're still going hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I wish in more places, but. Uh... <laughs> oh, you got to do self-care, too, you know, at this uh, point in your life. Yeah. And you yeah, can learn more about the Slim Kings at slimkings.com. You're good, Mark. See that? He's good. Um, good job. <clears throat> the researcher. So, Liberty, you, um, you've had a lot of ups and downs throughout your career. Uh, yes. And hopefully more ups than downs. But you're in a upswing now, and you're doing very well. You know, you get your bands, you get your marriage, you get your family. And yeah. what's really nice to see is that you do things for other people. You uh, are part of Little Kids Rock. Yes. And, and then also a uh, uh, nonprofit, uh, Camp Jam. Yeah, Camp Jam, uh, that was a while ago. Jeff Carlisi from 38 Special was part of that, uh, starting that. And Jeff has since left it and is kind of running on its own now. So um, I, I kind of like with the with being as busy with the with the Lords and being busy with the with the Slim Kings. Now it's kind of like that stuff. If I play somewhere and there's a, a little kid's rock uh, uh, class or something, the, the the whole band will go. And we played in Seattle and we went to um, a, a school where they had a little kid's rock program and played for the kids. Yeah, well, I, I'm doing a thing called Casey Cares. It's uh, raising money for children's organization. And uh, it's in Washington, D.C. And it's myself. Christine Ullman, who sings with the Saturday Night Live band, Ricky Bird, who was in Joan Jett and the Black Hearts, and, uh, you know, um, um, a lot of people like that, you know, uh, high profile people. It's going to be fun. Awesome. So that's in October sometime. Yeah. Excellent. And where is that again? 
somewhere outside of Washington, D.C. You know, I, I was just thinking if music doesn't work out for you, um, you I think you get a second career as uh, you could do uh, voiceovers for uh, Mike Rowe. Oh, Mike Rowe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's if this doesn't pan out. I got, I got to, then I have to put my fist up a horse's ass and I'm not ready. To do that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so, so this is, uh, this has been a, a blast. Is there anything else that you want to tell our audience? People like to hear something that no one's ever heard before. Well, well, you know, kids ask me like, how, how do I achieve being a successful musician? And my answer to them is practice, listen to others, and marry a woman that has a job, <laughs> which is probably the most important thing. <laughs> because there's a lot of times, you know, did you see Hired Gun? Did you guys see Hired Gun, the video, the documentary? I have not. Oh, you got to see that one. That's a real good one. Okay. Yeah, I'm um, in that. Oh, yeah. yeah I, there's a little little jam session in the middle of it. It's me and Kenny Aronoff playing drums. Uh, Phil X, from, who plays with Bon Jovi now, he's on guitar. A uh, guy from Five Finger Death uh, Death Punch is on guitar. Derek St. Holmes is singing lead from uh, Ted Nugent's band. Uh, it, 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 it's really good, and it talks about the reality of being a musician. Uh, Rob Zombie's on there and tells talks about what it's like to try to pick another musician to take the place of somebody who just left, oh, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. One guy says like, yeah, I went to my uh, ATM and my ATM said, hey, time to get back to work, buddy. <laughs> 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 awesome. So, uh, Mark, I think we gained a new friend here today. We had an awesome conversation yeah. with Mr. Liberty DeVito. Absolutely. Yep. Fun conversation covering a lot of topics and, and, and a, a storied career. You've, you've, yeah. you've had a great ride and it's not even not bad. bad. It's, and it's still going. It's still it's going. going and going strong. Love yeah. it. So yeah. Thank you so much again for taking your time coming on with us here at musicians and beyond. We want everyone to follow Liberty DeVito, follow musicians and beyond. We're on YouTube and on all major platforms Buy Liberty's book life Billy. Billy in the pursuit of happiness. Make sure you check out the Lords of 52nd Street. Absolutely. And Slim Kings, Lords of 52nd Street.com. Check them out. Slimkings.com. Yeah. All Great. those com. Liberty, Thanks. this was awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yes. Yes. And I hope I see you up there and wherever we're playing. We look forward to it. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, brother. You're welcome. It was a lot of fun. We prefer funny, and uh, you definitely brought that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be funny in this business. How could you not be funny? 100 percent You have to be. First interview, I didn't use the word Ringo Star. <laughs> <laughs> we we can it. hit record and we can go back and, and dub it. Uh, I'm sick of that guy. <laughs> We're all about first, and we just had one. That's beautiful. That's it. Awesome. There you go. All, all right, right, man. Have a good day. Thank you. Oh, you too. All right. Bye, take bye. care. Bye bye. bye. That was awesome. Fun guy. Lots of laughs.